Hello and thanks for joining me for some more landscape photography and today we're at Llinagada near the little village of Rhydddi in Snowdonia. It's an absolutely beautiful late November morning. The sun's been up for about an hour. And of course, at this time of year, it never gets up very high. So you get quite nice side light all day long. Uh, this valley is rapidly becoming one of my favourites and I've brought you here quite a few times uh, in recent vlogs. Uh, I've been up on the ridge at Agarn, across at Munith Mauer, and of course I'm always up and down to Araran uh, on the Ridley Path. It's one of my favourites. So I thought I'd bring you to Llinagada because it's not somewhere I've brought you before, but it has so much to offer. What we're going to be doing today is hanging around on the shores of the lake where we've got fabulous mountain backdrops, but we've got a little stand of pine trees with lots of boulders and mossy humps and it's just a really atmospheric location where you can quite happily spend a day getting shot after shot because there's plenty to shoot. Now I've already had a scout around. I was here for sunrise but there wasn't one so that was good because it took the pressure off getting myself organised. But I've got quite a few uh, half decent compositions in mind for today so hopefully it'll be quite interesting. It's somewhere that's really easy to get to if you park up at Ridvi. So if you're planning to come to this area and you want some uh, photography where the mountains are your backdrop this is just perfect. Well now, I can't tell you how nice it is to be out and about with a camera and it not be blowing a gale, pouring with rain. It's a beautiful flat calm day here at Llinagada and I'm taking advantage of the nice November side light on the southern flank of Snowdon with this particular composition. Now of course at this time of year the light never gets very harsh so if you do get some sunlight it's just perfect. Uh, I did have flat calm water a few minutes ago but by the time I got myself set up for this shot a ripple's come up so I'm going to wait it out and see whether or not I can get back to the lovely mirror conditions I had earlier. I've got a 10 stop filter on this which uh, I'm using the live time feature on this camera for uh, currently getting me exposures of around about 20 to 30 seconds. It's not really streaking the clouds at all because they're not moving fast enough uh, but it doesn't really matter too much and if I get the mirror finish again I'll probably take the 10 stop off so we'll see how it works out. I'll be the first to admit this isn't the sort of image with which you might associate my photography as a rule but I was attracted to this particular composition by the really nice side light on this fabulous Scots pine 
uh, I don't want the whole tree in the image. There's two specific elements that I'm keen on. One is the trunk and the other is the bottom branch that kind of comes towards the camera where the front edge of it is just catching some light rather nicely. Uh, the light is nice and warm actually. You wouldn't associate it with this time of year but it's got a nice feel to it. So I wanted to get in quite tight with it and I don't want any backdrop to distract me at all. So what I've done is I've shot it as wide as I can go at f4 and by positioning myself way back from it uh, uh, I'm able to shoot it at about 70 millimeters and that gives me a really shallow depth of field. Just focus on the very bottom of the trunk to make sure that everything behind it drops off nicely. I wanted just a little bit of foreground because there's little tufts of grass catching the side light as well uh, and just to kind of lead you into the tree but yeah I mean I, I just quite like the way the lower branches which are mostly bare of, uh, of needles just kind of run out of the composition. Um, not my normal sort of thing, but it caught my eye, so I thought, why not? Let's try something different. Now what we've got here is a really good lesson in giving yourself options. Let me explain. I spotted that the sun was catching the ridge up there between the, uh, the peaks of Agan and Munith Drusakoid. Uh, and it looks lovely because the rocks have got such great texture in them. But what I also noticed was that the clouds were coming over immediately across them. In other words, spreading out like that. Uh, perfect for a long exposure. So what I've been doing is playing with some different settings and taking all sorts of slightly different compositions uh, and enough elements to put some composites together if necessary. So uh, I've been shooting at round about f18 for the most part, uh, a very small aperture, but of course uh, sometimes you have to use the equipment you've got to get the result that you're after and I'm happy to tolerate the potential softness of the image for the effect that I'm going for added to that with a 10 stop filter and that means I get the clouds to look like they're kind of exploding from the other side of the ridge and that's been specifically what I've been after. I've taken uh, one or two compositions with a close-up of a garn when I first spotted it because at that point uh, the clouds are quite dark and moody uh, and I really like the way they looked as if they were being ejected from the summit like some kind of volcano but I was still getting a nice little slash of sunlight on the crag itself. So I've taken some shots that are just exposed for the crag and I've taken some just for the sky and also some overalls where if I don't need to stitch two together I don't have to. Uh, and then I noticed the light was catching uh, Manith Drusakoid as well so I've now come a bit wider. I've had to wait for a couple of things. One is that the light catching the trunks of these trees in the foreground was really bright and of course as the exposure ran on it got too bright and it would have been really distracting and very difficult to do anything about in post. So again an image with no light on that. I waited for the sun to go down behind a cloud and what that meant was that uh, I had a shot with these this nice stand of pine trees in the foreground as uh, nicely in shadow and that's what I wanted because they'll create a nice frame along the bottom of the image. Uh, another thing as a bit of a bonus I do have a slice of lake water in the image uh, and with it smoothed out over 90 seconds the colours and tones in that water is really nice. So I'm hopeful of a half decent image based off this last. I've been working on it actually for about 45 minutes uh, and I'm getting towards uh, the time where I've got a clock out. So do you know what? I think I might leave it there for this one. Perhaps what we'll do is have a little look in post and I'll show you how I bring those together because I haven't done much post lately uh, and I think it might be quite interesting. So uh, let's leave it here and let's head off home.
Now it's been a few days since that lovely morning by the lake and I've had an opportunity to bring together the raw files and I've got a couple of images that I'm quite happy with that I'll share the processing with you. Not in any great detail, just to give you a general uh, summary of how I go about it. But before I do that, I just want to say I do understand that this sort of photography is not to everybody's taste. Um, people will say to you sometimes that long exposures don't look natural. Well, no, of course they don't, in much the same way that impressionist oil paintings don't look natural, but I really like them too. Anyway, let me show you how I did it. So let's start with this close-up of the summit of Agan, uh, and I'm using this particular exposure for the sky and a second exposure, as you can see there, that's got uh, much better light on the mountain summit itself. So I start by taking these into Photoshop as layers. As you can see, I've got a whole series of layers here, and what I'm going to do is just talk you through as we build up those layers up to the top. So we start with the two RAW files that have been brought into Photoshop. The first thing to do, as always, is click on Edit, Auto-Align Layers, and let Photoshop make sure that even if your camera moved ever so slightly between exposures, it'll normally tidy that up quite nicely. The next thing I need to do is to create a mask because with these two layers here, the bottom layer there is going to be for the, uh, the mountain summit and the next layer up is for the sky. So I want to mask this, the next layer up just to use the sky. And because I've got such a sharp horizon, it's very easy, no problem at all to select that layer in the right area, create a mask, and there we are, it's that simple. So the black area is hiding this layer, only showing me the sky, and then the layer below is now showing through so I can see the summit of the mountain. The next layer up is simply a composite. Uh, I have a habit of, as I work along, quickly creating composites which basically merge the layers below. It retains the layers so I can go back to them if I need to. But as I work through, uh, I like to create composites almost as save points as I go along. It's just a force of habit and it just goes back to many, many years ago uh, when you were taught to save your work for every 30 seconds. So the next layer up is, as you can see, I've labeled it topaz and that basically is my sharpening layer. Uh, I use Topaz as opposed to Lightroom or Photoshop sharpening uh, and that's a whole video by itself, perhaps it's one I'll make, <laughs> I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you decide that, tell me in the comments if you think this is worthwhile, but that's my sharpening layer. The next layer above that is my contrast layer and you'll notice that as I switch that layer on it really boosted the contrast, I'll switch it off again, back on, there you go. And uh, for me I found that the recipe that I've saved with ColorX FX4 that works really well with the tone of my raw files, uh, I tend to use it on most images. However, by doing it as a separate layer, it does always give me the opportunity to reduce the opacity of that layer so that I can dial the effect down. The thing is, sometimes you get an image with a high dynamic range and you don't want that level of contrast on it well rather than mucking about with sliders and tweaking it up i can just simply apply my recipe uh, which i've got on a photoshop action uh, and then just dial the uh, opacity down a little bit so it just affects it as much as i want it to now the next layer is a camera raw layer and you can see that I've also used the same mask as I use further down, so I'm only affecting the sky. I've also turned this into a smart object, which means that I can go back to Camera Raw and I can tweak it if I want to. So I'll just switch that on and you'll see how it boosts the contrast, only the sky, not the uh, mountain top. So what I'm going to do is just double click on that and quickly fire up the Camera Raw filter to show you what I did in that filter. Now the reason that I'm using the Camera Raw filter, in other words exactly the same sliders and tools as Lightroom, and the reason I'm using it in Photoshop is because I can apply a mask. So if I use the graduated filter for example in Lightroom it wouldn't be as precise and I don't want to affect the mountain top at all. So all I've done with this is just a little hint of dehaze and a hint of clarity. Nothing else, that's all I've done on this layer. So just okay that. And then I've created another composite, force of habit. 
And then we get to uh, a solution I had to a problem that I discovered. And it may well be that you can't actually see this because you're viewing it on YouTube uh, and it might not show up. But there are some blemishes in the sky that have been enhanced by the additional contrast. They were virtually invisible uh, when I was working with the raw file in its raw state. But as you boost the contrast, if there are any blemishes at all, they're going to show up. Now, these are not dust spots on the sensor. They're probably seawater spots on my filter because I don't think I polished it before I started using it. But there's a really easy workaround. What I do with this is I'll just switch off the mask on the next layer up and switch on that layer. And you can see that that's really blurred. What I've done is I've set a Gaussian blur and I've set a blur of about 40 pixels. It smooths it all out. But of course, I don't want everything smoothed out. So what I've done is I've applied a mask to that so that only bits of it show through. And I'll show you that mask. I click on here. So you can see that most of it, most of that Gaussian blur is invisible. And all I've done is I've brushed here and there with a white brush with a very soft uh, outline. So the full effect of that is that here and there, that blurred layer is showing through and you can't see it. Of course, you can still see the uh, contrast in the sky that I was looking for, but it's smoothed out those blemishes. And I found that's by far the most effective way of dealing with that sort of thing. Because if you try and uh, use a uh, a spot heel tool, particularly on those subtle gradients in a sky, it's really obvious. Um, if you try and smudge them out, that's really obvious as well. I found that way with Gaussian blur works pretty well. Uh, and that pretty much is the uh, finished item in Photoshop. So let's bob back into Lightroom and just a few finishing adjustments. So here we are back in Lightroom. I haven't adjusted the crop. It's exactly the same composition, but you probably noticed it does look quite different. Uh, and the reason it looks different, because if you look at that, you can see how warm it is. I've dropped the temperature down quite a lot. Uh, I felt that the sky looked quite muddy. I wasn't really keen on that sort of brown tinge on it. So I wanted to get to a, a cleaner, fresher look. And so I just dropped the temperature down a little bit. Uh, I brought the whites up a little and the blacks down a little, as you can see, barely moved them, but just to bring my histogram to give me the full dynamic range. Uh, up the vibrance a little bit and then taken the saturation down. And then finally, just a couple of finishing touches where I've used some radial filters, brought the exposure up just a little bit there on the flank of the mountain. On this crag, I've brought the exposure up, but I've also warmed it back up slightly because I wanted to emphasize the sun hitting it there. So just a hint of, of warmth in the temperature and just a hint of saturation. And finally, in this bottom corner, I felt it was just a little bit bright and I didn't want to pull your eye down to a lump of bright cloud down the bottom here. So I've just taken the exposure down a little bit and just taken the edge off the whites in that area. And so that's my final image and I'm reasonably happy with it. Uh, now, the next image uh, is more an exercise in how I brought together different elements from different uh, exposures. So overall, a lot of the techniques are very similar to what I've just shown you. But specifically, there are a couple of things that are worth having a quick look at before we finish up. So this last one we're going to have a look at is the uh, similar technique, but the much wider shot of the ridge, uh, including the trees in the foreground and the lake. I used these three raw files to combine to create this finished one. And you can see the finished one is also cropped in. I've lost the top of the sky and a little bit of the bottom. Uh, but let me explain to you my thinking behind these. So these three layers, these three raw files, into Photoshop. And this is where I had to do quite a bit of head scratching to work out which bits of which raw file I wanted to bring together to create my final composite. Now the first of the layers on this stack, this bottom layer, pretty much accounts for the lake here and the trees. Uh, but not these bits of tree here. You can see how bright these trunks are. And I knew it was going to be very difficult to take those out. And I knew they'd also be a distraction down in that corner. 
So I have uh, one of the exposures further up, which I think is that one there. They're very much darker and that's much easier to take that distraction away. So this bottom one is just for the, uh, the lake water and uh, these elements of tree here. And if I show you why I've picked that one for the water, you can see this one, there was a ripple, so you've got that sheen on it. Uh, same on this layer here. So if I come back to this, this is where I've mentioned when I was at the lake, how there was those nice colours in the water. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm using that one. Now the next layer up, if I show you that, and you can see that I've disabled the mask. So let me just re-enable the mask and you can see now the lake water is now showing through from the bottom exposure. You can see that's that's got uh, black masking on it. I've also masked this area here uh, and part of the sky. Uh, this area down the bottom here is this tree because I like the way the sun was catching it and I wanted to retain that in my final composite. Uh, and then I didn't want to use this bit of sky here. In fact, on this particular layer, I'm only using this nice spread of cloud over here on the right hand side. But I am using the hillside on this particular uh, one. So the next layer up is masked to uh, show this hillside through. So we go to the next layer up. Let me just enable that mask. And you can see that's the final composite that I'm using. So these trees over here are nicely darkened. They're not distracting. Uh, and then, as you can see, because I've got the sky masked off, and if I show you how I've got this masked, I'm only using bits of the sky from this particular uh, layer to add to the layer underneath it. So the sky is a composite of the two layers, and then the bottom layer pretty much is just this lower part. I know it's complicated. It took me ages to work out which bits I was going to mask and which I wasn't. Now, everything I did after that kind of followed the process that I showed you in the earlier one. But that's about it. Quite a lot of work. I really enjoy sitting here mucking about doing this sort of thing. Um, and hopefully one or two of you will feel that uh, the finished product is worth the effort. I quite like them, I must say. But anyway, um, I think that just about covers it for this one. Thank you ever so much for watching. I really hope you found it interesting. And if you did, why not subscribe now and join me next time. Cheers.